Welcome to the Trombone Corner Podcast, where we feature interviews with trombonists from all over the globe. It's great to have you join us as we talk all things trombone. Brought to you by the Brass Arc and Bob Reeves Brass. I'm John Snell from Bob Reeves Brass. And I'm Noah Gladstone from the Brass Arc. Hi, John. How are you doing today? Doing awesome. How about yourself, Noah? Pretty, pretty good. We have some really special guests uh, on the podcast today. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Who is joining us in the corner? Well, funny you ask. We're doing a special joint collaboration with Nick Schwartz and Sebastian Vera, fine trombonists themselves and hosts of the Trombone Retreat podcast. So we'll get to their interview here in a moment after a word from our sponsor and some trombone news. Hello, loyal listeners. This is Noah Gladstone. I founded the Brass Arc in 2010 to celebrate the love and passion for legendary brass craftsmanship. I wanted to share my joy for the best gear and bring it to the forefront of musicians' minds through the development and cultivation of modern equipment with roots firmly established in the classic designs of the vintage masters. Bob Reeves Brass is a world-renowned mouthpiece maker of the highest quality and has been handcrafting mouthpieces for professional trumpet players for over 50 years. Together, we are excited to bring a premium line of handcrafted mouthpieces to the trombone community inspired by rare and vintage classics, and modernized for the needs of today's musician. Models are available in a variety of sizes, from small and large tenor, bass, trombone, euphonium, as well as custom sizes. We also have artist models available, as used by David Rejano, Jay Friedman, and Charlie Vernon. Visit BrassArc.com or TromboneMouthpiece.com for more information, and remember to follow us on Instagram, at the Brass Arc and at Bob Reeves Brass. Back to you, John. Well, is it too late to wish you Happy New Year, Noah? It's never too late. You can wish me Happy New Year because we're coming up on Lunar New Year, actually, this week. So Happy Lunar New Year. Happy Lunar New Year. And uh, thanks to all the folks who uh, checked in with us after Adam Wolf's interview uh, on the uh, Sackbutt Corner uh, (laughs) version of the podcast. That was an awesome interview, and we got a lot of great feedback. Uh, So thank you all uh, for checking in with us. Uh, Noah, what do you have going on at the Brass Arc? Um, you know, horns coming in, horns going out, uh, trying to, trying to keep up with all of that wonderful stuff. I'm very excited to say that I, uh, now have, uh, handle wraps actually at the brass arc, um, local made leather, uh, wraps, um, from the, from, uh, a fellow out here in California that makes really, really wonderful stuff. So, um, we've been talking about carrying them at the brass arc and I'm really happy to, kind of give him some support and some some shout outs by carrying his goods at the shop. So definitely check out the website. I'm going to do my best to keep um, a fairly good stock here, but you know, they sell out really fast and he hand makes everything and it's just one person. So, uh, you know, people be patient. <laughs> They're really, really great products though. So I think uh, it's very exciting times. That's awesome. We, uh, he was, uh, we met him at uh, Trombone Day, SoCal Trombone Day the other day. And yeah. you, you beat me to it. We were going to carry those. <laughs> we'll carry the trumpet ones at you our shop. You get the trumpet ones. <laughs> yeah. And actually, I ordered one for myself. So the, yeah, the handle wraps are awesome. So that, that's cool to hear. Any other yeah. cool horns in the shop coming in? or? Um, yeah, I have a couple vintage Bach-based trombones and some uh, really cool Minic stuff that just got here and some Sterling Silver stuff and all sorts of goodies. So uh, working on a web update right now, and by the time this podcast posts, it should be live on the website. So definitely head on over to BrassArc.com and scope out all the things that I have. Awesome. Well, we have some exciting things up here at Bob Reeves Brass. Uh, first of all, over the holidays, we redid the front office, the front room. So we have all new flooring and paint, and we're getting ready to set up some new display uh, cases and shelves and things uh, because, and this will be of particular interest to trombone players uh, starting last week, we are now an official Shires dealer. So we're going to be picking up some horns here in about a week. Uh, We just saw them at NAMM and they had uh, an amazing showing there. So we're going to be picking up uh, probably a handful of custom horns, uh, bass, uh, large bore tenor, and uh, maybe a few small bore tenor. uh, And of course, some of their Q series, which are also popular. Uh, So we're really excited. You know, they had a big presence here in LA years ago, and uh, there's kind of a vacuum now at this point. Uh, So we're really excited to carry those horns. And of course, we have Robert Coomber, um, which I know a lot of our listeners uh, have bought their Shire's horn from him in the past, and we're really happy he's on our staff. He's been here four years now uh, to help with the sales of those and help you find the right horn. 
so we have that going on. Uh, of course, we're making a ton of the Reeves Brass Arc mouthpieces. Uh, those have been going out the door. And we made a, another big batch of them to take to TMEA uh, next week. Uh, so when you're listening, depending on when this posts, but uh, February 8th to 10th in San Antonio, Texas, will be the Texas Music Educators Association Conference. That's a mouthful. If you haven't been in San Antonio, Texas, it's a huge convention. It's almost the size of NAM, but it's all just band orchestra choir, and uh, it's really a lot of fun. So we'll be there. Robert Coomber will be there, and we'll have the full line of the Reeves Brass Arc mouthpieces, as well as some uh, mutes, you know, Okura mutes, Olven mutes, uh, the Yupon mutes, a lot of the popular ones that we carry, and uh, we'll have those there for you to try out. Speaking of Olven mutes, one last thing before we get to the interviews here. Uh, if those of you saw Christian Lindbergh, uh, he did a recital tour across the U.S. this last month. He was using his Olven mute. So we have a couple of those in stock. And uh, for those of you that are fortunate to hear uh, Christian, uh, man, what an amazing, amazing trombonist he is and previous guest on the podcast. So you can go back and listen to that interview if you're one of the new subscribers. So if you're interested in the Shire's Horn, come by the shop. And if you're in and around San Antonio, February 8th to 10th, come visit us, booth 271 at the conference. And uh, one other thing I want to mention before we get to the interviews here is this is a, a collaborative podcast. Sebastian and Nick do the popular trombone retreat podcast. And so we interviewed them and then they interviewed Noah and I. So once you're done with this interview head on over to the trombone retreat and we'll make sure we have the links to that and listen to them talk to Noah and I. And if you just came from their podcast, well, welcome. We're happy to have you in the trombone corner. All right, Noah, shall we get onto the interviews? Let's do it. Take us away. John Sebastian Vera, a Texas born trombonist has been the principal trombone for the Pittsburgh opera since 2010 and the river city brass since 2015. He's a professor at Duquesne University and teaches at the Cleveland Institute of Music. Vera has performed with several prestigious symphonies and opera houses, including those in Dallas, Detroit, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, and New York City. His education includes studies at Southern Methodist University and the Manus College of Music in New York. A highlight of his career was volunteer teaching in Haiti in 2011. Vera, a former member of the Guidonian Hand Trombone Quartet, has contributed to various soundtracks and enjoys a range of activities outside of music, including basketball and psychology. He co-hosts the Trombone Retreat podcast with Nick Schwartz. And Nick Schwartz is a renowned bass trombonist, educated at the Juilliard School under Don Harwood of the New York Philharmonic. He is the principal bass trombonist for the New York City Ballet Orchestra since 2010 and has performed with prestigious groups, including the Pittsburgh Symphony, New York Philharmonic, the Metropolitan Opera, Philadelphia Orchestra, San Francisco Symphony and Ballet, Orpheus Chamber Orchestra, and many others. His career spans North America, Europe, and Asia. And besides doing the Trombone Retreat podcast, Sebastian and Nick co-founded the Third Coast Trombone Retreat, happening this year, June 4th to 10th, 2024, which we'll talk more about in the interview. Without further ado, here's our interview with Nick and Sebastian. All right, we have an exciting episode of the Trombone Corner today, and uh, happy to have join us Sebastian Vera and Nick Schwartz. Sebastian, Nick, thank you for joining us. Hey, how's it going? And of course, Noah Gladstone. <laughs> Noah, you're looking great today. <laughs> oh, thanks, John. You look good too. We even got the matching memo about the same shirts. So <laughs> we all kind of um, match. <laughs> Nick's got his shirt on, though. That's pretty nice. So this is going to be a fun, you know, the more the merrier. This is going to be a fun episode because uh, obviously we got four of us now in the in the trombone corner. Um, so let's let's start. Who wants to go first, Sebastian or Nick? Do you guys who wants to go uh, first about how you got started playing the trombone? Well, I do have a quick question. Is it because I know in New York City it's it's very much like ninety percent of clothing is just a black t shirt. Is that an <laughs> LA thing too? Yeah, kind of. I mean, it's like uh, you know, lots of lots of grayscale for sure. Uh, you know, we have the the Hollywood scene. You got to look really, really uh, slick. You know, like, so. like you're not trying too hard. But it's exactly, like exactly, exactly, exactly. It's the story of my life. <laughs> 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 so, all right. So, well, Sebastian, since you start started talking yeah, first, you start uh, talking oh, first. So there you go. That's real. How'd spot. you get started on the trombone? Oh gosh, uh, I was 11, and you know, just you know, typical my my. Came from a family of 
musicians. My mom is an amazing pianist. Her mom was an amazing pianist. And, uh, you know, you, you fill out the thing and, and say the three instruments you want to think about trying for band. And I, I wrote down saxophone because that's what the cool kids play. And then trumpet. And then I honestly couldn't think of a third instrument name when I was 11. And the first thing that came to my mind was trombone. And I didn't even remember what it was. And, you know, I think they just needed people. So they brought one out and like, ooh. So <laughs> here I am still stuck as a trombonist. That was it. The die was cast. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's almost like the trombone in the corner. Uh, was that? Was that Megumi we had? Or um, Megumi? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, so. the trombone in the closet. Yeah. <laughs> um, and how about you, Nick? Similar story? Uh, or? Quite different, actually. Uh, my family hired a Sherpa, and I climbed to the top of a mountain, and mm. um, and I had seven had seven flower. quests, and uh, upon the seventh one, I was presented a trombone. No, um, so um, <laughs> you know what? This does not yeah. surprise me at all. So it's <laughs> not a very good payoff for all that work. <laughs> it, it's not about the payoff; it's about the journey, Sebastian. That's what I learned. It's true. Um, for for my Sherpa Thanaset. Um, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, you know, I was going into band, and um, at least where I grew when, where I grew up and started playing the trombone was El Paso, Texas, and um, at that point i don't know if it's still the case anymore i wouldn't be surprised if it's changed because of the funding in schools it was it was mandatory to uh play an instrument that's you know for for at least a couple of years in my school so i had to go in band and i was talking to my parents um and saying oh well, what instrument should i play and my mom played the saxophone and the saxophone um no thank you uh great great for jazz and that's about it um and uh, my dad played the trombone a little bit in high school, and he described it, and I thought, that's you. pretty cool. You know, you get to make fart noises and blow spit on the floor. That sounds pretty good. And you were already was, doing oh, that. Yeah, exactly. Time. You know? Uh, so, I mean, it, it was it was a uh, love at first toot, I suppose. And then I the bass it. trombone just exacerbates the issue, so. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you know, the, the funny thing is, I'm, I feel like I was one of the odd bass trombone switches you know a lot of times when bass trombone players choose bass trombone it's because they have a crappy high range you know and um i actually had mm-hmm. a i actually had a good high range um but my teacher just thought i had a really good sound down low too and he was like i think you'd make a good bass trombone player and i actually didn't want to do it at first but he he convinced me and gave me some like recordings and stuff i had to listen to and i was like, oh, that's pretty cool let me try that out so um that's the continuation of picking the trombone and then the bass trombone, I suppose. Did, did you get lessons right away, Nick? Or uh, did, did it take a while? Were you self-taught kind of from the beginning? Or was your dad helping you? Or My dad, I mean, he played the trombone for like two years. He couldn't help me. <laughs> um, mm. uh, a pretty, pr- not right away, but within a couple months, my band director told my parents that I had a real natural knack for it. Um, and they suggested that uh, he suggested that I get a teacher and he hooked me up with the professor of trombone at university of Texas, El Paso, um, which is actually a good story in and of itself. My, my first lesson. So typical, you know, kid run around. My, my mom was a teacher too. And this lesson, let's say was at five o'clock. And so my mom worked on the other side of the mountain. El Paso is kind of divided down the middle by a mountain there's the east side the west side and the valley um and she and the sherpas and the sh- the, see the sherpas thank you you, you someone was listening right. um th- this right. is nice having people listen to what i have to say sebastian take note um <laughs> what <laughs> and uh so she worked on the other side of the mountain on the east side had to drive all the way back to the west side then we had to drive utep which was on the other side of town as well and um so running around like crazy and my mom gets home and it's like honking the horn like we gotta go now boy. and so like she came home with groceries or something i had to unload the trunk and my trombone was right there and she's like get in the car we have to go so i get in the car and we get like two blocks away and i was like uh i think i forgot my trombone my mom's like shut up i, I saw it out there you, you definitely packed it and i was like no i really think i didn't we should stop and look and no we don't have time for that and the whole time i'm starting to realize like oh i for sure forgot my trombone and I was trying to tell my mom, I, I left it behind. I'm telling you, no, I saw you had it, blah, blah, blah. And we get to UTEP 
And of course I opened the trunk, no trombone. And my mom, well, why didn't you tell me anything? <laughs> of course. And so I went to my first trombone lesson without a trombone, um, with a professor nonetheless. So I, I looked really smart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, it was, it was all uphill after that then, right? Well, well, this lesson too was my band director calling in like a special favor from the professor. Be like, hey, I got this, you know, sixth oh, grader. I think they should listen oh. to him. And so he, I remember him being very annoyed, being like, wow, this is such a waste of my time. Oh yeah. my gosh. So and how about for you, Sebastian? I mean, did trombone come easily for you or did you, did you have a private instructor help you along? Yeah, I grew up in a, you know, it's one of those things you don't really realize until you leave where you grew up. But, you know, I grew up in the middle of, you know, North Texas band machine area where, you know, every program's so well funded and really competitive. And so, you know, I had, I had lessons from, from sixth grade on and you just think it's normal. And then, you know, you move away and like, for example, I live in Pittsburgh now and there's, it's just not a very normal culture of students taking lessons um, from an early age. So yeah, it was, <clears throat> I don't know. I, I think I didn't realize that I had natural, some, some good natural things going on um, until later. I just really enjoyed it. Um, I, for me, like it was the, the thing that never got boring. Um, you know, I always say art is imperfectible. So it's, 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 it's one of those things where I always got excited about getting better. And yeah, when you're young, maybe the competitive aspect of it, especially in Texas, it's you know, you have a competition every week that you can do and compare yourself to other people, which is, you know, a problem in it in, in and of itself. But yeah, I, I just had so much fun. And then when I realized that I could do this as, as a living and, you know, if, if you would have told my 11 year old self when I started that I get to travel the world and play music and play with my friends and actually have a living doing just that, I mean, I never would have believed you. <laughs> Was, was there a moment where you realized that you wanted to do that uh, or was it just kind of gradually happen? Yeah, I had, that's a good question. I think it, maybe it was when I realized that I was actually okay at it and pretty good. Um, and it was just fun. And I, I had a lot of really close friends around me that were really serious about it. My best friend growing up, you know, he, he ended up going to Juilliard and he was just vice president of the New York Philharmonic and, now he's running this big performing arts center in Vail. And he was always way more serious than me and way more focused and studying with the college professor as like a middle schooler and all that stuff. So I was just trying to keep up with him, honestly. <laughs> and then, you know, you, you join the youth orchestras and you, you do this stuff. Like you go, you start going to the, like I went to Brevard music center in, in high school. And that was just a game changer being around other people that are as excited and nerdy about this random thing that you are. And, you just, you know, you get the bug. Yeah. How about for you, Nick? Was there a moment where you realized you wanted to do this as a living or did it just kind of happen organically? Has that come yet? <laughs> uh, I don't know if you can call out? that a living, yeah, right? Exactly. But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I remember there, there's one moment I remember. I think this was probably like if there was a moment, uh, uh, it would be this one. I was on like uh, winter break or Christmas break in high school. Um, this was when I was living up in Michigan at this point. And um, I was practicing and I was so excited about playing the trombone and like all the things my, my teacher assigned me extra, extra work for the holidays. And I got through all of it. Um, re like really worked on it and got through it. And I called my teacher and said like, yeah, like I've been just working so hard and like, I feel like I'm ready to play all those etudes that you gave me and the solos coming along and like all this stuff. And I said, you know, I think I, I told myself, I think I want to be a trombone player like you. And he was like, all right, let me think about that. And we'll talk about it in your next lesson. And we showed up for the next lesson. And basically he like quadrupled the amount of stuff that he assigned for me and was more harsh harshly critical than he had ever been and at the end of the lesson he's like if you can keep up this intensity from now until you know forever essentially then you're ready to be a professional musician if you think this is too much you shouldn't even try and 
And it was wow. intense, but like, I think, I think he was kind of like, all right, like, I know how hard this is. He obviously doesn't. He's in high school. Um, let me make it as ridiculously difficult as I possibly can to try to deter him in any way. And just to see like how passionate I truly was about it. And I was never deterred at all. And then he realized, oh, I think he's serious. He really wants to do it. And so, you know, he stopped being so overly critical and just holding me to a high standard, which is, you know, he was, he was, he can still is a great teacher. Uh, Kip Hickman's his name. He's the principal of Toronto's Kalamazoo Symphony. And um, I know Kip. You know Kip? Great player. Yeah. He's from, yeah, yeah. He's from uh, um, Um, San Diego. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that's right. But he, yeah. I studied with him when he just graduated from University of Michigan. So, man, that's a weather yeah. difference growing up in San Diego and then living in Kalamazoo. Yeah, I know. Right. No wow. kidding. <laughs> but uh, yeah, K- Kip was awesome. I mean, he, he definitely. I think that when he was, he, he's a great, great player. player too. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Like, yeah, great player. <clears throat> um, but I think he was relatively new to teaching, so he probably hadn't had any experience with uh or not much experience with students who said i'm serious about this i want to do this and uh you know i think he handled it super well instead of just like talking to me and saying oh this is so hard blah 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 he like you know put the put the weights on the bat and said all right let's see what happens here and to see how serious i really was or if it was just a fad like when a kid says that you know i want you know i want to be a marine biologist when i grow up and then next week I want to be a chemist, you know? Um, but he realized pretty, pretty quickly that I was serious and, you know, I never lost that drive. Uh, so my parents started realizing that I was serious about it too. Cause you know, I, I, I don't know, uh, if there's a scarier thing for a parent to have their kid come home and say, I want to be a professional musician. I mean, it's like almost as bad as saying, you know, I want to be like a, a performance artist or something like that. <laughs> Interpretive dancer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there you well, go. Nick, Nick does I do, do I'm, that. A, I'm a beautiful dancer. I, I mean, you were in, uh, you were in uh, Big Lebowski, right? Doing a, a dance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Once, right? With uh, Ju- Julian Moore. Is that, uh, that's who it was, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, cool, cool, cool. Um, cool. So then you guys both decided to make a go at it and go off to school and do the things. Um, how was that for you? Like, you know, being in college and starting the gig and <laughs> all that stuff. Well, that's being in college. That, that could be a whole podcast. That, that's a lot of things that happened. Uh, young, young Sebastian. And a full head of hair. And a um, mind yeah. I mean, dreams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What happened? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> everyone just listening to this podcast, I have a beautiful long head of hair just flowing. There's, there's wind that's just, it's just like constantly flowing. So just imagine that. Um, no, I was lucky. I mean, I, John, I, I didn't mention John Bowles was my teacher who is this, is this amazing, uh, teacher in Texas. And, you know, so me and Brian Hecht and Zach Bond, um, we all had him, um, to get, get us started. And then, you know, you know, I thought, you know, I think Nick was similar. We, when you're young and you want to do it, you kind of have tunnel vision and you're like, oh, well, I like the trombone. I'm pretty good. Then I want to be in an orchestra someday. And so you study with people in orchestras. And then, you know, as I got older, I, I, I realized that there's so many other ways to be happy and be successful and in new ways that haven't even been thought of to, to, contribute to the world and make good art and pay your mortgage. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, did the, did the school thing. Uh, so with John Kitzman, and the Dallas symphony for four years, recently retired and then spent a year in Ohio and then went to New York city and, you know, thought I'd be there for two years and New York just sucks you in, but got to study with the New York Philharmonic guys. And um, yeah, I just summarized like, like, 12 years in about 30 seconds beat that nick <laughs> well well fortunately you guys have your own podcast too so you can yeah exactly. fill in the fill in the blanks <laughs> fill in the details in an episode yeah sebastian's um, college years uh in the yeah. next episode i think will be <laughs> not one drop of alcohol you know bible study every morning I, bu- mm-hmm. of course bible and a glass of water straight to bed yeah 
homework. Luke, lukewarm milk, actually. That's what I think your drink of choice was. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Nick. Lay All right. Uh, well, I went to, for like kind of a unique experience, I went to Interlock and Arts Academy for my senior year of high school. So that was uh, kind of like almost college-like in a way because you're living away from home. And um, that was an amazing experience. I loved Interlock and still, still love Interlock. And, um, and then from there, uh, went to school in New York. Uh, Sebastian's going to make fun of me because uh, he says I always talk about Juilliard, but that's where I went to school. You went to Juilliard? Went to oh Juilliard. Yeah. You should talk wow. about that more yeah. often. Um, so I went there, and uh, then I wanted something different, just a different change of, a change of pace, I suppose. So I went to um, San Francisco and started at, I started there in September of 2006, and I dropped out by the end of October um of 2006 and it was it wasn't for just being lazy or something like that i I actually started working um freelancing there and i wasn't like you know the phone wasn't ringing off the hook but i was getting just enough work that i was like you know i think i'm gonna make a go of this rather than going into debt in school going further into debt in school so uh, i ended up doing that for four years and then here we are back in new york coast to coast to coast Yeah. yeah Yeah. San Francisco is a, is a, is a fun place. It is a fun place. It's a lot more fun when you have money though. And I didn't have a whole lot of that. That is, it's an expense. It's an expensive place. Yeah. It is an expensive oh, place. I can't Absolutely. imagine being a young music student and trying to afford to live I mean, there. That's gotta be tough. In San Fran, I can't Since imagine. Since I've been 18, I've lived either in Manhattan or San Francisco. Those are the only two places I've lived since I've been 18. So I've lived an expensive life. <laughs> I didn't know you were independently wealthy. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, sweet podcasting. Exactly. Books, yeah. <laughs> Just living off his wife's yeah, coattails, which is yeah. all of our dreams. Sugar daddy, sugar mama, actually. So, would you guys mind talking a little bit about the transition from school to working, you know, professionally? Uh, and then Nick, you were saying you were already starting to freelance and you're during your graduate degree. I mean, did that just continue to pick up, or you know, what does that look? Well, like? Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's why I I ultimately dropped out of my graduate degree was um, I was getting just enough. It was just enough work that I was going to either have to start turning down work or you know do poorly at school, which I was, I was really good at doing poorly at school. So I had no problem with that, but I think you'd already mastered yeah, yeah, that. I've been, I've been doing that since, uh, I don't know. I was 12 or so. Um, but, uh, so I decided to drop out, which was, um, you know, a leap of faith. I'd, I'd call it. It's, there's, unless you win a job, like right out of school, it's, it, I think it's a hard decision to make, like when to make that transition, like out of school and into the real world. But, and now as a teacher myself, I see so many students that are just like perma students. Like they don't know when to just like pull the plug and like make the jump. And it's like, if you don't have something secure set up, I think it's very hard to do because it's like, you're taking a big bet on yourself and then you actually have to do the hustle and make it all work. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I, my freelancing stuff, uh, peer freelancing was out in San Francisco, um, where that was my only source of income, which is freelancing. Um, and I did that for four years and then I won a job here in New York city at the New York city ballet. And that's what brought me back here. Um, and, uh, yeah, still hustling and, but, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think that's the biggest takeaway for me, like looking back and the thing I, I guess I'm proudest of is that I did make that leap of faith and there were a lot, a lot of nights of, uh, rice and beans or ramen dinner, you know, but it's, it's, all, it's, I'm glad I did it. And I encourage, uh, a lot of younger musicians who I think could make the same leap to, to do that rather than go back to school. I, I mean, I can't believe how many people come up to me and are like already out of school for a year or multiple years. And they're like, I'm thinking about going back and getting another degree. And I'm like, why? Like, unless you want to become a doctorate, like why, what's the point? <laughs> and there, yeah, I think it's tough though, you know, for younger students, especially when you show up and you're the youngest person in the room, it's like, how do you behave? And it's super intimidating. You're walking in, you know, these are people that you maybe, 
know or have seen on stage performing and it you know it gets like what do i say what i do the wrong thing they're judging me constantly it's all true uh it's kind of it's kind of like know. it's kind of like prison you gotta you gotta walk in the first day you you punch the contractor yeah. in the face <laughs> you gotta assert exactly. dominance like, don't make I'm eye here. contact never make eye contact you gotta fluff yeah. out the right make sure you talk shit about everyone's exactly. playing and yeah yeah it, perfect you'll be yeah. asked back in no time <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I remember playing a gig with a young student. This was like three years ago. Uh, right, at the, right, at, it was like right at the tail end of the pandemic, if there was a tail end. Um, and we're playing these gigs. It's like all like pretty seasoned professionals. This one kid who's like still still in school, just about to graduate, and we were playing something. And the intonation wasn't the greatest, and he stops everybody, the young guy, and goes, um. Are we turning to 440 or 441 like that? And <laughs> a trombonist from the Philharmonic was sitting next to me and he goes, Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he's, it, I mean, he just like shrivels. <laughs> oh, man. Well, yeah, and that brings up a good point of the things that you don't learn in music school that, you know, keep your mouth well, shut. How to, how to be a freelancer, you know, that's yeah. something that a lot of people don't teach. Yeah, there's a great, uh, I think we have it on our website, Gary Grant, you know, the great trumpet player out here in Hollywood had a list, you know, of 50 things to do to be a successful studio musician. And I think every third or fourth one was keep your mouth <laughs> shut, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and bring a pencil. So. Uh, Sebastian, how about you? So what was your uh, transition from school into the professional world? Were you already gigging, freelancing during school? And what did that look like? A, a little bit. And and I love talking about this subject and that it's part of the reason that we started our, our festival, which I'm sure we'll get into. Mm-hmm. But it, it's it's not talked about enough, I think, that transition from school to the professional world and, you know, you know, college curriculums, music curriculums have been in place for a long time and not they're, they're very slow to change. And so there's so many skills in school that I wish I, you know, I wish I had a public speaking class. I wish I had basic finance class, a uh, basic marketing class. Um, I think everyone should be required to learn arranging and improvisation and, you know, their performance psychology. I mean, there's a million things. And, and so, you know, you got to learn by doing in a lot of ways, but yeah, it, it was a it was a slow thing, and it, I had some really good people around me that really taught me the value of, of saying yes. Especially earlier on your in your career, you can't be snobby about what you're you're getting offered. Um, so just do everything, even if it pays like you know a free dinner and twenty five dollars. <laughs> if you're not doing anything else, it's so you start that way. Especially you know being in grad school in New York City, I feel like prepared me. It's probably like being in LA in a lot of ways. It's it's very competitive. There's a lot of people wanting to do what you want to do, and you're rewarded for being proactive. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I think a lot of young people when they graduate, they're like, "Oh, if I'm good, you know, people will just call me and give me stuff." Um, and they think it's like somehow uh, takes something away from them to put themselves out there, communicate. So. I mean, I I was in a a trombone quartet. Actually, um, we started in grad school, and we ended up getting really serious about it. It was called the Guadonian Hand, and we got a lot of grants and did a lot of um, New American works and had management and traveled around. And that that was so good for me. Being being in a chamber group is the world's best education for um, getting better and playing with others quickly. And even on orchestra gigs, I can tell if someone has a chamber music background or not. There's just a certain level of listening that's there. Um, but yeah, I, I was lucky to to win principal trombone in the Pittsburgh Opera a few months after uh, grad school. And it wasn't something that I could just be like, okay, I'm set. Let's let's move to Pittsburgh and have life. It wasn't quite enough to to only do. So I stayed in New York for for a few years and commuted during productions. But then I just, you know, I loved it here in Pittsburgh. I felt a part of the city and it was just a quality of life that I really loved. And so I just, you know, you just start to build around it and being opportunistic, having really understanding your identity and what you want and what makes you happy, I think really helps inform these quick decisions you have to make about when opportunities come by. 
and seeing like, yeah, I could do that. I would be good at that. I would enjoy that. That would fit into my career. Um, and so I just started to build around it and, you know, started to get some university teaching positions. I teach at Duquesne University here in Pittsburgh now. Um, and then uh, another group I play on the River City Brass Band. And then you just, you know, you start developing relationships with orchestras and players around you. And, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of, you know, and Noah, you're, you're a contractor, so you probably know this better than anyone, that you can tell when someone wants something from you. Mm-hmm. Like you can tell when someone is getting to know you and it's just looking at you like this thing that has something they want. And I just, I wasn't raised that way. And I hate that whenever you sense that. And my, I just want to get to know people and I want to be around talented people and people that I like and are interesting. And if work comes from it, awesome. Um, if they trust me for that, that's great. Um, so that's kind of how I've, that's my mindset. And it's, you know, it's worked out and I feel really lucky to do a lot of different things instead of just one thing all the time. Um, I think it's fun. Um, it can be scary for some people, but it's, you know, it's that diversified portfolio approach where like, I can't depend on one thing only, but everything combined is great. And if I lose one thing, I'll be fine. For for me, that's like mental support, actually, like, you know, playing and contracting. I do lots of things, obviously, in the the shop and all these things. And for me, it's like, I just like to be a busy person. I'm always building businesses and building things. Um, And if I have any downtime, like, what can I be doing with my time? So for me, a lot of the things that I do kind of come out of my own cathartic, you know, process for me to just be doing things that I enjoy and then, you know, people respond to that. And when you're really good at something or passionate about something, people absolutely pay attention. So, um, you know, I always come back to like, can I be doing my best work? Am I doing my best work? People respond to you doing your best work. That's kind of it. So um, totally get it. And I think that's really what it comes down to. A lot of these younger people, they do expect a lot, especially this younger generation. They have been kind of spoon fed a lot of things. You know, for you guys, we're all about the same age. I'm sure grew up with your grandparents telling you about the depression and all that and, you know, mm-hmm. how awful it was back then and how work was and you can never take anything for granted. And it's like that kind of distills into your work ethic. Um, and then I, you know, I'm finding a lot of my younger students, not that they're, they're bad kids or anything like that, but, uh, you know, they come out and they have been kind of spoon fed a lot of things, been told they're really, really great and haven't necessarily had to have that same kind of drive to, prove to themselves what they can do and what they're capable of. And I think that is kind of a, a detrimental thing. So, uh, you know, definitely some self-reflecting is good. So I, I would love to hear, I think that probably kind of segues into your your uh, trombone retreat. And I'd love to talk a little bit about that because I think what you guys are doing are really is really terrific. You want to take sure. it? Sure. Um, do you want to know about like the genesis of it or like? Well, yeah, how did it start? Like, how'd you guys get the idea? Were you in a bar drinking and like, hey, we should do this? Or that was I guess, specifically, I mean, always, always <laughs> great ideas. Right? <laughs> Start at the bar, um, but uh, over breakfast yeah. tacos or breakfast Ooh, tacos. That See, good, that's right more now. of a West Coast thing. I mean, bre- bre- breakfast tacos are everywhere, but more of a West Coast slash Texas thing is the breakfast taco. Texas yeah. here, it's yeah. Texas. Well, there's the big just, breakfast taco war between what was it, El Paso and San Antonio about who started them? Or I mean, there's. Oh, there's a blog post about it. El, pa- El Paso would seem the most logical. It's right on the border. Um, but whatever. Let's yeah. John, by the way, John, you're gonna be at I, I heard you're gonna be at Team EA. We have to go get some barbecue and breakfast tacos. Oh yeah. Sure. Oh yeah. Let's do it. Oh, I just had breakfast and I still want a breakfast taco. Yeah. <laughs> Second breakfast. <laughs> yeah, like a hot one. <laughs> um yes. and uh so, well, the, 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 I was going to say the thing here in New York, of course, is bacon, egg, and cheese on a roll, which pretty darn good. That's that's a that's an elite like elite sandwich as well. And and bagels. I mean, you guys have the bagel scene. L.A. Ba- uh, there's uh, no good bagels. That, eh. it's, there's, it's not that bad. No. It's, it's not. A, it's not. It's not a, a desert. There's a couple spots in L.A. You know, yeah, a couple spots. They're they're new. They're they're popping up. Right. Uh, definitely, people are are. And they're also eight dollars oh, too. That's yes, the thing. that's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, And they you have gluten free options and a bunch of bullshit like that. Locally um, sourced. So, <laughs> was the bagel happy before they <laughs> killed it? You know, those kinds of things. So we we care about yeah. here on the West Coast. <laughs> um, 
So Tramon uh, Retreat, as it's of course now known, um, well, Third Coast Tramon Retreat, uh, obviously we didn't know the name when we were talking about starting something like this, but we were sitting at a bar in Columbus Circle, um, bar that no longer exists anymore, unfortunately. It was, there was a bar inside the Whole Foods, which oh, was no. awesome. Um, and uh, we just started talking about like, you know, our experiences in conservatories and the things that weren't taught that should be taught and how, you know, how'd be cool to start something of our own. And it was one of those things that, you know, there was enough beer involved that the next morning I can't, I think Sebastian wrote me first and was like, Hey, were you actually serious last night? And I was like, that depends. Were you serious? You know? <laughs> and turns out that we both thought it was a, really good idea but we also knew it was kind of a crazy idea too um at least somewhere in our brain knew it was crazy which i think the genesis of most good ideas start with this is kind of a crazy idea too you know um and uh so we decided uh well let's start unpacking this thing one by one okay what do we need okay we need a location uh and we kind of spitball a couple ideas. Of course, the one idea was Texas. Um, that, was, that that would be logical with Sebastian's ties to Texas. I mean, I I lived in Texas, but only played trombone drum, there for one year of my life, so I don't really have ties there. But so really, Sebastian, um, and uh, obviously the big uh, scene there with all the the, the high schools, high school students, and we didn't know what our age group was going to be at that point, but then I said, well, you should, we should check out West Michigan where, where my parents now live. It's really, really beautiful in the summer. It's very, very nice. Unlike Texas, uh, it's very nice in the summer. <laughs> what um, do you mean? So we went there together and started talking to, there's a local arts council in this community and started talking to, you know, they said, oh, if you need a venue, you should talk to this church. So then we went and talked to the church and it's, it just seemed like for us, I mean, for as crazy as an idea as we sort of thought it was, uh, these people must have thought we were nuts, you know, uh, having all these trombone players descend upon this really small town in West Michigan. Um, but at the same time, they were super supportive and just said, well, you can come use our church for free. And like, they, they just wanted, they were like throwing everything at us. To, they wanted us to make this happen because they thought, like, wow, it's, it's something very unique to bring the community. And so with that lack of, I mean, more than lack of resistance, just absolute welcoming from the community. It seemed pretty obvious to both of us that that's a really good place to start this thing up. So we chose West Michigan. Um, and then from there, we just started unpacking all the, all the problems that arose, you know, where are these kids going to stay? Um, how are we going to get them to and from the airport? You know, all, all the logistics and, you know, you just put out one fire at a time as anyone, as all, all four of us here really know when you're starting something out, it's like you start with an idea and then you have no idea what, what sort of problems are going to come your way. Um, even if you brainstorm and think about every scenario that could possibly happen, there's always something that's going to catch you off guard. Uh, Murphy's law is a real <laughs> thing. Yeah. Yep. Well, I, I remember day one, Absolutely. first first event we had, we had um whose master class was it? I think it was Jeremy, Jeremy Moeller from Chicago Lyric. He he gave a master class or that was the first thing we ever did in, 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 a, in coffee a coffee shop. shop. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we've come a long way. <laughs> um and uh this kid comes up a student comes up to us and he's like, My my zipper broke on my trombone case. And it seems like something so simple, but it's like, man, I don't know how to, I don't, there's nowhere around here that can fix that. And how are we going to get you to be able to carry your trombone around, you know, without it falling out of the case? So we, I think we ended up like bungee cording it together before we could get him to a place. <laughs> I don't remember to that at fix all. it, but it's just, it's little stupid stuff like that. Cause it's like, it's a little problem and it needed to be taken care of, which takes time. And I had like no time because I was running around like a chicken with my head cut off because all these other problems were arising and, and Sebastian didn't have any time for the same reasons. And we were woefully understaffed and, um, but, uh, we, you know, we pulled it off and 
pulled it off very successfully. And it, you know, it, it became this thing like that we really wanted it to be, which was both an like number one, an educational experience with a uh, talented, talented trombonist from all over the place. Uh, and number two, and almost equally as important to us was that we wanted it to be the op- almost the opposite of conservatory life in its vibe, which is, you know, the, the stressful is, is what I would describe college slash conservatory life. And we wanted to bring people back to like remind themselves why they are doing this in the first place. And I think that's something we've been very successful at um, year to year and gotten even better because the more organized we are, the more relaxed the event can be. Um, and uh I think that's that's probably my favorite aspect of what we do with the Tromone Retreat is we provide so much con- like content for the students and, and uh, opportunities to learn, but we also try to make it in an environment that's very relaxed and very easygoing where everyone's friendly and it's not super hyper competitive and it's just, um, yeah, we, we, have, we have a lot of fun with it, but man, oh man, thinking back mm-hmm. to the beginning of this thing, Sebastian. So, <laughs> so many times us putting out fires that we thought were going to come up and it, that wasn't the fire that ever needed to be put out in the first place. And, <laughs> and that, and that's something I bet both of you guys appreciate. And I, I think with any people, with anyone that's starting something, the biggest barrier is starting. And most people don't want to start things until they feel like they know what's going to happen and they know how everything's going to work and they have all the answers. And I'm sorry that just never, it never is like that if you actually want to get anything going. And so, you know, the ready, fire, aim approach and learning by doing, and we had no clue what we were doing, but we knew who we were and we knew what we wanted to say. We knew the impact we wanted to have, which I think was the most important thing. And so, yeah, we're, we just finished our 10th year. Um, our first year, hung on by the seat of our pants, but the students still loved it, which really meant a lot. And this area is just gorgeous. It's, it's right on Lake Michigan. It looks, it has white sand beaches. It looks like the ocean, you know, during the summer, it stays light out to like 1030 at night. Um, it's, it's a real, uh, it's a, it's a sailing boat town. So like everyone has a boat and we go out on boats and, but there's dense forests and deer running around and your phone doesn't work half the time, which is great. So it's this beautiful, isolated thing. And for us, it was really important to keep it focused and personal. And so, you know, we could make this as big as possible and try to make as much money as possible. But for us, the impact was the most important. So now I think we only accept 16 uh, students, 12 tenors and four basses. It's, it's, I don't know if we mentioned it's a, it's a workshop, you know, um, people audition and uh, it's turned into this thing and, you know, figuring out how to pay for it first of all was was a challenge and now we have a lot of great resources and you know we we brought in Joe Alessi last year and um we're we're able to bring in world class guest artists and these students are you know hanging out at at a bar getting to sit next to their hero asking questions um sitting at a bonfire and you know sounds like you're teaching a lot more than just trombone actually so yeah you know yeah that's the goal because I mean Sure, we could be. It could be another festival where it's like some famous trombonist who just like got this huge job out of college, teaches you excerpts. But you know, there's so much more to life than that. It's like, yeah, we're really focused on getting work and creating work for ourselves so we can do this thing we love. But we also want to be happy while doing it. So we want to talk about both. Um, And it's you know, it's it's equally, it's equally. For us, it's it's the single most um, amount of work we do in a week per year, but it's also the most fulfilling week of our year. And and luckily, we have some great staff with us. And now it's this well-oiled machine, and the the variables are much less nowadays. And it's just this fun experience. And then you know, we we had all these amazing conversations all the time, and and got to be around all these people all the time. We're just like, oh, we should just start recording some of these conversations <laughs> we had and you know, keep the brand a thing. So is that, that's where the podcast started. Yeah. How many beers in were we for that one? <laughs> that was, uh, 
the that was you know while it ended up being what what kind of read like a pandemic project uh it was it wasn't at all actually we we started talking about it maybe i would say probably 6 months before we started doing it um and it was it was one of those things it was just like well if we start it we we have to make sure to keep doing it we don't want to just do like two episodes and fizzle out and i you know that's where the pandemic actually came into play in a positive way but when we did our first interview which was with paul pollard that was january of 2020 and then we did one more interview when sebastian went to hawaii and and we interviewed jason byerlosser who plays ramon out there and then the pandemic hit and so it was really easy to keep up momentum when you know we were working in some capacity during the pandemic i was teaching a lot online sebastian was as well um, but generally speaking, you know, we were one tenth as busy as we normally are. So it was a lot. And so was everyone in the world. So the couple, all that together. <laughs> and guests, guests are so easy to book right? when, you know, everyone's oh, just sitting at it home. So, yeah. <laughs> it's just like, Hey, anybody in the world, you want to do an interview? They're like, do I got to put on pants? Like, sure. Well, let's do this. Like, <laughs> up to <yeah>. you. <laughs> Dealer's exactly. choice. It's like, oh, today's a banner day. I'm going to go from the bedroom to the computer and then back to the bedroom. <laughs> I remember on, like, on the trombone, I mean, on the trumpet side of things, it was May 4th, you know, Star right. Wars Day. And I think Sarah Willis was doing like a horn live stream with the horns from the from the soundtracks. And I was like, man, what am I doing? I'm just sitting around home. So I, I called John Lewis and said, "Hey, maybe maybe we can do a live stream, you know, because the horns are doing this thing. Let's do the, you know, the trumpets can do something." And within an hour, he he said, "Yeah, I'd love to do it. Let me get the rest of the section." <laughs> and within an hour, I was live with all of like those six or seven trumpets, including the subs that were on the you know the Star Wars soundtracks, at so, least wow. the last three. And I was like, when else could that possibly happen? Except when everyone was sitting home during the pandemic, yeah. you know, some of the most busy players yeah. in the country. Probably. Yeah, they were all sitting around. Sure, I'd love to go live. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah, so that's so cool. So I know. Yeah, how, what episode are you guys on now? I mean, you guys are like prolific. Like you guys have cranked them out. Uh, I, you guys know it's, it's so hard. The consistency is something that, you know, nothing in our career career is consistent as far mm-hmm. as a schedule goes. You know, every week is going to be different. So yeah. trying to have a consistent podcast is is a challenge. And, you know, talking to Noah about, you know, you're saying that you want to be able to do everything the best possible. So, you know. I'm such a perfectionist and I want every interview to be so well prepared and so well edited and sound good. Cause all of our listeners are, you know, sound is important, you know? So, and I didn't know how to do any of this stuff. So right, kind of along in, right? with the that's theme. Awesome. Yeah. That's, you know, we recorded that first episode with Paul and it took me months to, to put it out. Cause I just didn't know where to start as far as editing. And I probably spent like eight hours editing that first one. Cause I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and it, but you know, there's a YouTube video for everything, and once I got over that hump, then the fun starts, right? And then you re- you really start to enjoy the thing, and then the art of interviewing is such a beautiful thing, and it kind of I think it resonated with me because I'm I'm naturally I'm more on the introverted side. I, I enjoy asking people questions and getting to know them one on one much more than I'm not at a party talking to everyone at the same time, you know. Um, so. It, it, it was just a really cool thing. And yeah, you learn as you go. You hear the production value gets so much better as we go. I think we've technically there's 50 episodes as far as straight up interviews. It's I forget which one. 45 on, Nick, or something. The 30. Yeah. yeah, man. Something That's like that. So cool. um, and it's funny because Noah was posting about starting a podcast at the exact same week we were talking about doing it. I'm like, of course. And so I messaged you right away. I'm like, that's awesome. We're doing one too. I hope that's not weird. Well, um, we actually had your you place be on it. <laughs> so that's right. We knew, we knew we had some Intel. So we're like, man, we got to We got to beat them to the market. Come on. And, and I told, I think I remember I sent Noah a message right away. I'm like, that's awesome. And I'm a big, you know, all tides lift all boats. Absolutely. Kind of guy. Like, yeah. Well, low, low tides don't I think lift there's all so boats. many stories that can be. T- <laughs> you said all tides. tides. So, uh, rising tides. All tides. Uh, yeah, rising rising, rising yeah. tides lift sorry. all boats. I, I think is the quote. 
Thank, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Fool me once, shame on me. Because <laughs> it's like everyone has a story, and it's I I imagine you guys have found this too. It's not like we're not just. It's not like the trombone, and most people that hear you have a trombone podcast think you're going to be talking about equipment all the time. And no, it's stories with you know uh, trombone adjacent people happen to play the trombone. It's centered around trombonists, but it's stories. Mm-hmm. And that's what I really love. And during the pandemic, that's the the joy we found it brought to people that felt so isolated and um, had had a voice. And and hearing things like "It's okay that you had a bad day and you 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 haven't been able to practice for a few few days." Like it's okay, you're human. And you know, it it became this really special thing. And I I think you know I listen to. I mean, I'm a huge like sports fan, so I, I mean, I probably listen to three or four different Dallas Mavericks podcasts a week. I don't think there can only be one, um, and so I, I just think it, it's it's a really cool medium, and and benefits have come in ways that that were unexpected. Mm-hmm. Totally yeah. agree. Yeah, totally well, agree. Well, that's a good segue actually for us to kind of swap over. Yeah, I here, think so. Um, and let, yeah, and let and let you, you guys. You don't take want to over. talk. You, you didn't want to talk uh, equipment, Noah. You don't want to get there. Oh, I'm sure we're going to talk equipment in the next. Okay, bit. we'll do that so, on the other side. So I think this is a good time to swap over, and then now uh, our trombone corner listeners can go over to your podcast and hear the rest of this episode uh, when you guys take control here. Um, I guess then we'll ask you guys, since this will be the official end of our episode, what is your? Uh, if you have one piece of advice for our listeners. And uh, it could be not trombone related, maybe shouldn't be trombone related, or can be trombone related. What would uh, what would that piece of advice be for those lovely listeners that we have? Nick, you get to go first. first. Well, I'll give uh, I'll give. How about a trombone one and a non trombone one? Great trombone. Practice slow. Practice smart. Don't be an idiot. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, non trombone, I would say that uh, I, I don't know. Jeez, learn how learn how to cook. People like uh, people like to know people who know how to, who know how to cook. That's <laughs> a good. That's, and as like as it. Sebastian was saying, there's YouTube videos for everything. Exactly. So, yes. You know, there really teach is. yourself. There's so many yeah, so many cooking resources out there. All right, Sebastian. Don't go to college. It, yeah. All right. I mean, I'm a big believer, and it's it's. You probably hear a general theme of what I've been saying today is, you know, progress, not perfection. I I really believe in, and don't don't if you have an idea and and you care about something, just try it, and and figure out along the way. Don't be afraid to fail. Is probably the most important lesson I've ever had because there's so much things that people are afraid to start. And you either you either are successful or you learn. Um, so don't be afraid to crack some eggs. Don't take every little setback personally as as defining you. It's just if you had a bad audition, if you had a bad interview, if you had a bad test, that's one day in your life, um, and you can you have a choice in that moment. You can go home and buy a bunch of ice cream and watch Netflix for two weeks, or you can look in the mirror and ask yourself what you could do better. Um, did you prepare as best as you could? Did you do all the things you know you can do? Um, and if not, cool, get back in the lab and start again and don't let it define you and let it take you per- take it personally. And I think if with that mindset, especially if you can instill that in young people, the world literally is whatever you want it to be. So I guess that would be my best advice. Wonderful. Sebastian, Nick, thank you so much for joining us in the trombone corner. And then let's, uh, let's hop over to the trombone retreat, okay. shall we? Well, after meeting Nick and Sebastian in, at the ITF in Salt Lake City last summer, it was really cool to finally have them on the podcast. And uh, now I understand why their podcast is so popular. They're funny guys, but also very insightful. Yeah, I really enjoyed talking to them and their format is is really interesting. So uh should be really fun um, interview after ours, ours here with them. So make sure that you head on over to the Trombone Retreat podcast. We'll have the links here below. I'm sure it's also available on all the platforms if you do a quick search. But uh, head on over there and make sure you catch the second part of this interview on their podcast. 
So head on over to the Trombone Retreat Podcast, and until next time, keep on sliding.